There we go. Welcome. Uh, <laughs> I call this meeting the Board of Directors meeting for Dr. Cog to order for Wednesday, August 16th, 2023. Uh, and with that, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. With that, we will have the roll call. Uh, also, I do want to introduce, we do have a new alternate. Uh, the new alternate for the city and county of Denver is Chantel Lewis. I'm not sure if Chantel is here, but I uh, wanted to definitely recognize that Chantel is the alternate to Kevin Flynn. So, with that, roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Adams County, Steve Odoricio. Uh, Lynn Baca for Steve Odoricio. Thank you so much, Lynn. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Present. Claire Levy, Boulder County. Here. Austin Ward, City and County of Broomfield. James Marsh Holshen, City and County of Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. Nicholas, or sorry, George Marlin, Clear Creek County. Nicholas Williams, City and County of Denver. Here. Kevin Flynn, City and County of Denver. Here. George Teal, Douglas County. Yes. Marie Mornis, Gilpin County. <clears throat> Tracy Crafts Arp, Jefferson County. Yes. Lisa Ferre, Arvada. Dustin Zvonak, Aurora. Juan Marcano, Aurora. Larry Vidum, Bennett. Here. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Margo Ramson, Bomar. Dan Plowski, Brighton. Here. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Here. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Jason Gray, Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer, Centennial. Present. Todd Williams, Central City. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. <clears throat> Craig Hurst, Commerce City. Here. Catherine Whitman, Nakono. Steve Conklin, Edgewater. Good evening. Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Cher Wink, Inglewood. Ari Harrison, Erie. Sarah Laughlin, Erie. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. <clears throat> John Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Present. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Rich Barrows, Georgetown. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Present. Paul Hazeman, Golden. Here. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Stephanie Walton, Lafayette. Hello. Jeslyn Sherazai, Lakewood. Present. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Kyle Schlachter, Littleton. Kat Bristow, Lockbuoy. Jacqueline White, Lockbuoy. Wynn Shaw, Lone Tree. Present. Joan Peck, Longmont. Dietrich Hoffner, Louisville. Deborah Fahey, Louisville. Holly Rogan, Lyons. <clears throat> Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Here. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahold, Nederland. Here. Richard Condo, North Glen. Here. John Dyack, Parker. Jeff DeBorg, Parker. Sally Daigle, Sheridan. Neil Shaw, Superior. Here. Jessica Sandgren, Thornton. Here. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Here. Bud Starker, Wheat Ridge. Here. Darius Pakbaz of CDOT. Here. Uh, Sally Shafee, CDOT. Brian Welch, RTD. Right here. All right, perfect. And with that, uh, we do have a quorum, Mr. Chair. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, we will move ahead to motion to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you very much. Director Pulaski is the second. Uh, with that, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? And any abstentions? Okay, thank you very much. Move forward to the report of the chair. I'm going to uh, add something in here that is exciting in regards to our friend Lisa Smith. Commissioner, Commissioner Tracy Kraft-Sarp, if you would uh, share the news. Yes, I'm pleased to um, let everyone know that Lisa and her husband had their baby this last week. Um, Elizabeth Carmen, lots and lots of long, long dark hair. <laughs> They're all doing well. Thank you very much. With that, we will move ahead to the report on the Performance and Engagement Committee. Commissioner Jeff Baker, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We had a meeting right before, well, at five this evening. We had one action item, a discussion of a restricted hybrid option for the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. This would be a suggested uh, proposal to change our, um, our rules on in-person versus virtual meeting. And so the board will see that 
in its entirety next month. Uh, we also had an informational briefing about the annual awards celebration from Amber Lieberman, and uh, it looks like things are going well. The uh, reservations can be made now, so I'm encouraging everyone to sign up to be able to come to our awards celebration. And that concludes my report. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And the, the fastest committee chair in the world, uh, our Finance and Budget Committee Chair, Colin Whitlow, who runs a, a mean meeting. Your report. Thank, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the committee for their time tonight and, of course, staff for their um, continuous um, performance of greatness in our, um, in our Dr. Cog area. We had four action items for this evening, all related to uh, for authorizing the executive director to amend or added contracts. And the first one was Bright Systems for an additional $100,000 for the term ending in December 31st of 2024 for enhancements on that. Um, next was to execute a contract with Lotus Engineering and sustainable, sustainability in the total amount of $350,000 for the term of September 1st, 2023 through January 31st of 2026 to support Dr. Cox's climate pollution reduction grant planning efforts. The third item on our action agenda was to negotiate and execute a contract with CDOT for consolidated planning grant funding estimated at a worth $14,944,293 in support of the fiscal years 24 and 25 for the Unified Planning Work Program. And last but not least is to negotiate and execute a contract with right-click solutions to provide an online platform for the Way to Go program not to exceed $104,000 for a term ending September 1st, 2024. Sir, that is my report for you tonight. Thank you very much. appreciate that. And with that, we will turn to the report of the Executive Director, Mr. Doug Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And good evening, everyone. I'll start this evening with our, with our housing work we're doing uh, internally here. Uh, we're moving right along with identifying a consultant to, to assist in our regional housing assessment, um, an interview panel with representation from our member local governments, DOLA um, and staff, as well as our our board chair participated on, on that team and uh, held uh, consultant interviews last week. Um, we, you know, our next steps in our procurement process um, is to make a recommendation to the Finance and Budget Committee. And I want, again, I want to thank the Finance and Budget Committee's flexibility and scheduling a special meeting to allow us to get that done because our hope is to have a contract with a consultant by the beginning of September so we can really, really hit the ground running. Um, also related to housing, I attended a CMLCCI convening mm -hmm. earlier this week related to housing. Um, it was really, truly a great opportunity to, to share perspectives on housing amongst a very diverse group that was in that room. Um, there were elected officials, um, housing developers, Home Builders Association, local governments were represented there. And I think we had a really, really good and robust conversation with the whole idea that we can you know, truly identify common ground and share goals, and hopefully there are some strategies that we can collaborate and, and find some unison around. So I'm really, I was really encouraged by that, and I'm, I'm sure it's just one of many meetings that we'll have upcoming. I do want to recognize Director Steve, Steve Odoricio and for his work in, in, in coordinating that. Rick. <laughs> Oh, I, I, I lost, oh, there we go. All right. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Oh, uh, Civic Academy. I wanted to mention this real quick. Um, we're starting our new cohort of our, our Civic Academy. It's a seven-week-long um, series of speakers and, you know, basically work program for, for, the, uh, for the participants. Um, if you know of anybody, you all know who they are. Those folks that show up at all your meetings all the time that you think might, might uh, really um, – you know, take some pride and maybe even learn a few things related to what we do here in the region. Please send them our way. We'd be happy to, to have their their participation. Uh, I learned tonight that our that our very own very own uh, delegate from Netherlands is going to participate this year in the Civic Academy. So we thank you, sir, so very much. Appreciate you doing that. Um, the first class starts on September 12th. So please, if you would, just please sp spread the word. Um, award celebration, I won't belabor the point. Lord knows it's been talked about enough. But I will say that we're still building our uh, sponsorship base. 
Um, I'm a little more optimistic about where we are than what I was last month, but uh, we've still got a long ways to go. So if you have any leads associated with any corporate donations or uh, if you're interested yourselves in, in purchasing a table, that won't hurt my feelings. Uh, and if you, you need any help in, in, uh, in getting that going, we'd be happy to. So just please reach out to, to myself or um, anyone on leadership here. We'll, we'll get that going. Speaking of awards, we do have some good news for, to share with you. Our Dr. Cog Way to Go team uh, was honored at the recent Association of Commuter Transportation International Conference in Seattle on August 2nd. The Dr. Cog program was honored with the Excellence in Research Award for our Bike to Work Day survey and analysis, which measured the long-term impact on behavior change to increase bicycle commuting. The organization noted this research will benefit the entire transportation demand management industry for years to come. So big shout out to all of our folks here at Dr. Cog, including Nisha. Our way to go manager, Nisha Moksha, Mok, I always say Mok, Moksha Gundam, as well as uh, um, Jim Eshelman, who's our research manager for all the tremendous work that they've done. So I appreciate you all. Um, just on a side note, so this international conference will be hosted in Denver next year. So that's a that's a that's a big coup for us. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. One, one quick observation that people may not have picked up on our scene, but I'm looking straight at Steve and Anisha. And as Doug was talking, they were pointing at each other. <laughs> that's awesome. That's cool. So thank you. Very good. Uh, I don't want to jinx it, but I will tell you that the awesome Dr. Cog staff has made a tweak to our sound. You, you know, we've been at meetings where the, the batteries go dead. And, and the podium. Yeah. So pay attention tonight because uh, much better. So okay. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will move ahead to public comment. If there is any public comment, this is the opportunity. Up to tw 45 minutes is allocated for public comment. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time can be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. Chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker, if any. Do we have any public comment? Online, we have Mr. Randall Lope. Randall. Okay. Um, Give it one more second here. Unmute. Thank you. It's a pleasure, as I've always said, to be able to participate in any aspect of the, the organization. I'm looking forward to the event that takes place um, coming up. And I'm part of a leadership conference that takes place in Washington, D.C., near the state the nation's capital on um, people with lived experience uh, testifying on what it is that we need to do in order to care for people coming up in this world. And uh, as I always have said, it's a partnership. And when you're having discussions as you were alluding to regarding housing, it's really important to have the shared experience of people who are attempting to take care of themselves and find a way um, to um, live with dignity. There's a program that was just started by the Gary Community Ventures um, called uh, betteroffer.co.org, which offers $40,000 to individuals for development of their skills and also uh, $20 an hour guaranteed um, in a $10 million um, funding of agencies to make it possible for people to start out their lives without debt. They don't have to pay back this money or anything else in, unless they become um, successful. And that's the kind of spirit of change that we need in order to make sure that people have an opportunity. I noticed that the Denver Department of Works also was offering, Waterworks is the offering a trade training uh, for people um, paying over $22 an hour. And so the other part of it is that we have to make sure that the cost of living adjustments keep in, in uh, line with the needs of people throughout our region um, who don't have uh, adequate income in order to pay their bills. 
And as an elder, um, of course, I always talk about the fact that having free transportation like has been done the last two months is essential and making it possible for us to ride um, without having the problem of whether or not we're going to be harassed if we're on the trains and buses is essential for our well-being. Um, we really need to increase all of the services that are available for mental health and substance abuse and uh, use, I meant, and also to make sure that people have adequate means um, to get the uh, services that they need when they're developing programs that are trauma-informed. And with that, I'll be quiet, but I really appreciate being able to share with you tonight and you take care. Second. And my microphone wasn't on. See, back to that radio guy not understanding how <laughs> microphones work. My apologies. So we had a motion from Director Vidim, is that correct? And a second. Second from Mr. Kondo. Thank you very much. Uh, any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And any opposed nay? And uh, any um, abstentions? Did I hear a nay on that one just to double check? Did I hear a, a nay just so we can record it? Okay, I think uh, the, the Director Flynn and I both heard something that we thought was that, but it sounds like everybody was affirmative, so okay. Um, although it's certainly okay to, to vote otherwise. Uh, with that, we'll move ahead to action items, discussion on the draft fiscal year 2024-2027 Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP and Associated Air Quality Conformity Determination and Greenhouse Gas Documents. And we have with us uh, Todd Cottrell, Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations. Sure. And see, I was bragging on how great that microphone system is, and I forgot to turn <laughs> this one on. So. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome board members. So this evening, we are talking about the tip and the Associated Air Quality Conformity Documents. Um, so we'll ultimately be looking for your recommendation for approval of three documents, the 2427 Transportation Improvement Program, the Ozone Conformity Determination, and the State Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report. Uh, just as a reminder in Attachment C, there are also links to these three items. Um, there's also a, a link to the errata sheet which outlines the changes to the tip from the public hearing version that you saw last month. There is also a public comment summary, um, which includes the comments, a summary of the comments that you heard a month ago at the public hearing. Also the preceding 30 days uh, for the public comment um, summary. So how do we get from a regional vision to projects that are actually programmed with real funding um, over the next four years? Um, that is done through the work of our Metro Vision Plan and our Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. The TIP, through the application and through its policy, includes some of these uh, objectives, tasks, and um, investment priorities from these two plans. So there is a direct connection from Metro Vision through the re Regional Transportation Plan connecting to those projects that we're selecting in this Transportation Improvement Program. Just as a reminder as what the Transportation Improvement Program is, um, it is going to contain four years of actual specific and dedicated funding to real projects. Um, again, it's over a four-year period. Dr. Cog has the, um, the authority to direct funding through five funding programs. Um, the first four here on your screen are federal, um, the last being the state federal funding source for the Multimodal Transportation and Mitigation Option Fund. It not only, the TIP not only contains projects um, that are selected by Dr. Cog, but it's also going to contain projects from other sources like federal and state uh, funding sources that were selected by either RTD or CDOT, for example, 
It may even include local, um, larger regionally significant projects using local funds only. A new document is created every two years, even though typically we do hold calls for projects every four years. And this is not a static document. So it's going to be amended um, almost monthly, um, usually 11 to 12 times a year. Uh, next, I just wanted to outline what those major elements of this program are. Um, first being the funding allocation process, and that's outlined here on the graphic on your right. Um, the two main elements of the allocation process is the regional and sub-regional share calls for projects, but we also do have the set-asides. Um, again, a smaller amount that will have additional calls for projects throughout that life of that four-year tip. The second major element is the sub-regional forums, a forum being one of the eight individual counties and all the municipalities uh, contained within. Um, many of you do serve on your individual forums, and it's a way for, for Dr. Cog to not only achieve that regional vision, but really for each one of these individual forums to inject any local values into the process if they choose to do so. Ultimately, when those forums do make that recommendation, they all do come back to this body. Um, and finally, the document is really that third major ele element, um, of course, of what you're seeing tonight um, for approval. So a little bit more detail about the calls for projects and the process to develop this 24 to 27 tip. It was abnormal, I will admit. We came back to you many times. Um, for those who were involved in the forum process, um, it was long and lengthy. Um, in fact, that entire process um, was around a year and a half. And even if you look at the TIP policy development for this cycle, uh, we were probably stretching about um, two and a half to three years for that entire process. We were covering five funding sources over six years, 2022 to 27, both TIPs, so the current TIP until hopeful adoption tonight. Um, those first two calls for projects were to program additional projects into that, that TIP. And then also the last two calls, calls three and four, primarily were focused and on the development of this TIP. When we looked at all of the information before us, the, again, as I said, it was quite different. Um, and that really is due to three main things. First, we had a new federal transportation bill. Um, that provided additional years of funding for us. Um, it was also at a unique time where we quite, weren't quite ready to actually have calls for projects to develop this tip. But again, that's sort of why we expanded this call from two to four. There was also the state greenhouse gas roadmap that sort of was settled in the middle there. Um, at first, primarily that was through work on the regional transportation plan, but there was some interaction in the TIP, so we had to work and coordinate around that timing. Finally, the additional multimodal options funds that were available to us um, through the state. Um, at this time, the state did dedicate approximate 10 years um, worth of funds, but those were certainly front loaded in 22 and 23. So there was a work in progress to develop those and, and allocate those through those first two tips. In summary, this was a very confusing process and we can understand that, but I think we navigated that very well. Um, and it's important to really look at not only um, just one individual call and maybe what your um, agency received funding for, but look at the collection of projects. So look at calls one, one through four, and I think that will tell a better story and we'll have a summary of that here a little bit later on. Overall, a half billion dollars in Dr. Cog funds, $2.2 billion overall um, that's contained within this tip. We also need to chat about federal air quality and the state greenhouse gas rule um, because based on our non-attainment status, um, the region through our plans, the RTP and the tip must and is required to reduce pollutants. And when we talk about all of this conformity and these pollutants, we're looking at projects on a regional scale. So we're not looking at individual projects and how they may affect um, what is happening in the ground at that time. We're looking at all of these projects collectively and what they're doing in terms of our status. Um, two to three years ago, there was also the introduction of the um, state greenhouse gas roadmap for all new and amended plans through Dr. Cog. And again, we're really looking at those regionally significant projects 
that were contained within the regional transportation plan and therefore the TIP. Overall, so what were those results? Um, and this can be a little confusing, so I just wanna make sure I get this right. Um, all of those regional, regionally significant projects that are in this TIP, this 24 to 27 TIP, were already federally required and are included within the adopted regional transportation plan. And since all of those investments are consistent with the RTP, we can therefore conclude this TIP did pass all the pollutant emission tests for regional air quality conformity and also complies with the state greenhouse gas planning rule. So the next few slides in conclusion is just really describing um, what is this tip really looking at? What is it trying to accomplish? Um, so we're looking at this slide and this pie chart, looking at it by funding. Um, as you can see, 62% of the funding um, within this tip is going towards those active transportation projects, 23% for transit, 14% for road. 190 intersections are gonna be improved um, throughout these four years for all modes of traffic. 95 miles of bike ped facilities are gonna be built. We are constantly looking into the future. Um, in a couple of years, we're gonna be looking at the 28 to 31 transportation improvement program. So we are preparing for that through these four years with, uh, through 34 studies. 70% of these projects will implement complete street elements. 80% will improve connections to transit. And finally, 65% are gonna be in, an, in or near urban centers. 70% are gonna be on the Dr. Cog defined high injury network. Through their applications, sponsors are projecting over the next five years, 51 fewer fatal crashes, 302 fewer serious injury crashes. With that, happy to take any comments or questions. There's a proposed motion on, on your screen. And again, I would like to thank everyone who was involved within this process, because again, it's been uh, very long, but hopefully this is a, a very well thought put together collection of projects. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for all your work too. Questions, comments? Sure. I just wanna say, I, I thank you very much, Todd. Um, I'm the Southwest Weld Forum Chair and have been for a couple of years. And to help guide me through this process, thank you, Jacob, Todd, Josh, Ron, the whole gang. Thank you so much, because I know we're just a little bit of all, the big pie but it is a, it's a process and you guys have made it um, possible for us to understand the whole, the whole thing. So thank you very much for your time and all the meetings that you have attended with us. So I just wanna say thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Question. Lacking any? Ben, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. I move to adopt a resolution to approve the fiscal year 2024 through 2027 transportation improvement program and the associated air quality documents and the GHG transportation report. Dr. Like Starker. Thank you very much. Mr. Flynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just wanted to follow on uh, uh, Director Whitlow and give my thanks to the Denver staff as I am the chair of the Denver Subregional Forum and through all four calls, uh, the very dedicated and hard work that our staff put in, some of whom are sitting in the back of the room. I just wanted to recognize them as well. Thank you. Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And I did want to echo the comments of the two previous speakers. Um, I'd be remiss and not to thank staff for the tremendous work. I remember the day that Ron and, uh, and, and Todd came in my office and said we were going to do this in four calls, and I said, they're going to kill us. <laughs> they are going to kill us. There's no way we're going to do this. And Todd's ability to coordinate this whole endeavor with Ron's leadership, I want to thank you so very much. Josh, for all your work, sir, thank you very much. You all do such a wonderful job. I used to sit across from Todd back in the old building. I learned so much from him, and no one had ever had a negative word to say about Todd. Lots about me, but not a lot of negative <laughs> stuff about Todd. So, um, and again, to, chair, to uh, Director Flynn's comment with regards to staff, while we're coordinating this effort, the work that's really being done out in the subregions is your staff. So I want to thank you so very much for, for your dedication to this, because I know when we, in, we, 
we started this new tip process two cycles ago. Um, you know, I know there was some anxious times with regards to how much how much work this was going to be, and it is a lot. So, but I hope you I hope you realize that we're we're getting to uh, I think a process which is uh, I think amenable to everybody. So thank you all so very much. Appreciate you. We have a motion on the table. Any more comments before we move to a vote? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? There you go. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your work. Fantastic. Uh, moving on, discussion on the fiscal year 2024-2025 Unified Planning Work Program, or what? How do you say that? Up, 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 up. Okay, there you go. Uh, for the Denver region, and we have Josh Schwank, Planner in Transportation Planning and Operations. Sir. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I wanted to start with some context as to what this Unified Planning Work Program is that we're here to discuss tonight. Um, so Dr. Cog, as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region, does receive funding through both the Federal Transit and Federal Highway Administrations uh, to support our work, uh, to support our transportation planning work in the region. Uh, so as part of that, we developed this document to uh, outline all of the work that we intend to complete over a two-year period in the region. Uh, this is how we communicate what our plans are for that work back to our federal partners, as well as with all of you in the region, as well as with the general public. Uh, so this document does cover two federal fiscal years, 2024 and 2025, and it's also how we uh, internally uh, schedule and budget out staff time and resources to ensure we're able to accomplish all of the tasks that we plan in the document. Yep. Um, so as we're developing this, there's several things we have to keep in mind. We do receive guidance through our federal partners as to what must be uh, included. So all MPOs in the country complete a regional transportation plan, complete a transportation improvement program, et cetera. So we need to make sure that all of those required activities are accounted for within the planned activities in the document. We also receive sets of planning factors and planning emphasis areas from our federal partners. Those are essentially topic areas that we need to make sure that we're addressing somehow throughout the work that we do. And we also have local priorities. So those are spelled out through MetroVision, through the RTP, as well as priorities that we've heard from all of you. So if you recall, several months ago, we did present to board work session and gathered some feedback from all of you as to what your priorities were. We've also presented to our other various committees, uh, to our state and federal partners, as well as to staff to get their ideas as to what we should include in this upcoming document. So I won't run through all of these, but on your screen are the 10 planning factors that we receive from the federal government. These are set in federal legislation. So the current transportation bill, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act includes all of these. And we need to make sure that we are addressing them in some way through all of the work that we do. And we also receive eight planning emphasis areas. These are released jointly by FHWA and FTA and more reflect uh, some of the current priorities of the administration. So in the beginning of the document, there are two tables where we uh, outline all of the activities in the document that we think uh, help us to meet each of these. So going into a little more detail on the document in front of you tonight, the structure is much the same as we've had uh, in prior cycles. So it opens with an executive summary and introduction. It proceeds into some of those federal uh, requirements that I just outlined for you. And then the primary section of the document uh, is broken out into nine objectives. Those are broad categories of work that we intend to complete. Within each objective, there's a number of activities, essentially more specific topic areas. And then within each activity are bullet point lists of specific tasks that we want to work on, as well as deliverables that we will produce. So a deliverable. A deliverable might be something like a plan, a study, a report, something like that. And then at the end are a few appendices just to provide some additional context. 
So as I mentioned, there are nine objectives in the document. Um, I'll just run through each of them quickly for you. So objective one, this is uh, primarily our staff administration training, as well as compliance with all of our various federal and state requirements. Objective two includes all of our outreach, both to the public, as well as all of our local government partners around the region. Objective three is mostly focused on MetroVision, as well as all of our land use, housing, development planning. Objective four is the regional transportation plan and our various uh, multimodal transportation plans. Objective five is all of our air quality planning work. Objective six is the transportation improvement program, as well as our various tip set-asides. Objective seven is all of the systems operations work, uh, safety planning, as well as innovative mobility. Objective eight, this is actually a shared objective with RTD, it's all of our transit planning in the region. And objective nine is all of the data and modeling infrastructure that go to support all of the other work that we do. So just wanted to highlight a few of the major initiatives planned. Uh, as you can see, there's quite a bit uh, that we intend to complete within the upcoming two-year period. So we have uh, planned updates to our non-discrimination plans, those first three bullets, uh, our public engagement plan, our active transportation, freight, and regional Vision Zero safety plan. We're also looking at developing, of course, the next iteration of the UPWP, um, some climate action plans that are associated with the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant, uh, our new TDM strategic plan, and of course, the two-year update to our TIP. And then some of our planning initiatives are going to be a little bit too big to complete within this time period, but we'll start the work uh, towards an update to MetroVision as well as the regional transportation plan, and then that four-year update to the TIP, uh, which includes a call for projects. We'll start that, those discussions within this time period as well. And then we have our various Im new implementation plans, or excuse me, implementation programs, uh, including around some assistance to local governments around our greenhouse gas mitigation action plan, our upcoming housing and transportation coordination plan, our new tip set-asides around corridor, community-based small area planning, as well as innovative mobility planning and programming, and then our new regional BRT partnership program. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that the board may have, and I also have a proposed motion available for you. Thank you very much. Olivia. Do I have to, I, okay, so it's on. I think so, I have to hold it down while I'm talking the whole time. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. I, I'm just curious um, what goes into the Title VI implementation, um, you know, what that process is for our work. Coming in and out. Sure. Um, so I'm not the program manager of that, but I can share what I know and I think Jacob might have some additional details, but uh, we do receive um, federal guidance around our requirements associated with Title VI, so ensuring uh, non-discrimination in our region. Okay, I'm actually going to hand it over to Jacob because I'm <laughs> sure he can answer it better than I can. Josh is actually doing a great job. Um, if you'd finish the sentence, I think it'd be there. But um, yeah, Josh is exactly right. Um, as a metropolitan planning organization, we do have federal requirements around non-discrimination. We do have federal requirements to, um, to prepare, adopt, implement, and update a Title VI plan that really talks about access to our transportation planning, to our programs and services, to the things that we do, engagement. Um, there's even a section around what's known as complaint procedures. I'm not sure we've ever received a complaint, at least in my decade plus here, but we do have complaint procedures, you know, if someone wants to do that, how we make information available on our website. So it covers that spectrum of things, but under the umbrella of um, making, again, our work, our documents, our processes um, accessible to all. Okay, thank you. I was um, thinking of the context of, like, RTD. Title VI analysis and where they look at um, their planned routes, the funding they're spending, and the and the they're serving. And so I was wondering if if anything you may think we have a new and improved system here, but it's not staying <laughs> at the podium. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. keep working on that. Yeah, thank it, you, Director Olivi. Yeah, I think I got the point of your question, Director. So short answer is, yes, there's definitely coordination and collaboration between the two, but 
they are different topics and different scales and different situations. Um, I won't speak for RTD, but I think you summarized it very well from my understanding of what their requirements are specific to their operations and the service that they provide. Ours are more, are more general and broad related to our overall planning process. So again, they're related, but they are a little bit different. That, that answer, Mike. Dr. Peck. I have a simple question. When you say the Denver region, can I assume that you're talking about the whole Dr. Cog region? Um, yes, so this is um, associated with our Metropolitan Planning Organization function, so it would actually be to the MPO boundary. Um, so that would exclude Clear Creek, Gilpin, and Eastern Arapahoe and Adams counties. Director Kendo. Thank you. Uh, you have a long list of deliverables. I'm just curious. I know this is a highlight presentation, but I'm assuming you have a Gantt chart or a timeline with specific waypoints of when these various things are going to be completed? Yes, um, we do have those uh, on kind of the internal side. Um, so this is a little bit more broad, uh, just to make sure that we don't have to come back to you every single month to amend it. Um, but on the internal side, we do have those schedules um, to uh, plan out how we're going to accomplish this. Uh, there were uh, several months of discussions between all of our managers and our staff just to make sure that we had the time and resources to make sure that we could accomplish all of the tasks listed in the document. Great. Um, I just remember a mentor telling me one time, if you have to eat an alibi, you have to eat it in pieces. Lofsky. I am. Why, why is Adams County excluded? Um, only the eastern portion, east of uh, Kiowa Creek. At the Kiowa Creek. Don't include us all then. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, do I have a motion? <coughs> we'll, we'll, uh, yeah, there you go. We have a motion and a second, thank you. We already have a second. <laughs> Any further discussion before our vote? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. The opposed nay. And any abstentions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation and all your work. We appreciate that. Moving ahead with the informational briefings. Uh, first is the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board update. Once again, Jacob Rieger, Transportation Planning Manager, Transportation Planning and Operations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. I mostly have the easy job of introducing our speaker, but I do want to give a little bit of context for this item. So Dr. Cog has had representation in Front Range Passenger Rail planning efforts since 2017. Um, it was a great honor for me to represent you all on the former Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission um, and to be the vice chair of that commission. That commission was replaced by Senate Bill 238 in 2021. Um, with the Front Range Rail District Board. Um, and part of that changed our representation as well. We are now represented by current and former elected officials of the Dr. Cog Board. Um, and we also have other representatives who don't directly represent Dr. Cog, but are either on our board or in our region. So I do want to take a second and recognize you all. Um, in no particular order, former um, Dr. Cog Board Director Julie Duran Mollica, um, Director Deborah Maldi, uh, Director Joan Peck. Uh, director, uh, former director Chris Nevitt, now at the city of Denver. Um, and then uh, Director Claire Levy uh, represents uh, the region uh, in terms of uh, the unfinished fast tracks corridor that is a position on the commission, uh, but she's bringing that Denver region, Dr. Cog region voice to the commission, or excuse me, to the district board. Um, and then um, Commissioner Randy Wheelock uh, from the I 70 Mountain Corridor Coalition. Um, is also on the Front Range Rail District Board. Um, and then I also want to recognize Josh Lapley from the City and County of Denver um, and General Manager and CEO Deborah Johnson from RTD. They are both uh, from this region on the Front Range Rail District Board. So thank you all for your service. I wanted to recognize you. What we really wanted to do tonight um, was to um, have staff from the Front Range Rail District Board come and talk to you. They've been meeting for just over a year. Um, they've engaged in a lot of startup activities, both organizationally, but I think more importantly, uh, 
starting to engage in um, service development plan efforts, things related to advancing front range passenger rail planning, um, and a lot of engagement as well. So without further ado and stealing her presentation, Chrissy Bright from Front Range District Rail staff. When I saw there was a new microphone, I got so excited, but then I got nervous. Um, <laughs> Jacob, thank you for um, the warm introduction for also stopping because you definitely were taking my talking points. Um, I think Jacob said it really well. So many people in this room have such deep history with passenger rail that I'm going to mostly skip through my slides and try to get through them um, quickly so we can have more of a conversation. So for much of this that's repeating, I apologize, but for those who are newer to the ride, um, welcome aboard. And how do I do the slides? Is it not? Okay, I'm sorry. It just pressed a few more buttons, yeah. Um, so I think probably like every Dr. Cog presentation, you touch on the issues of roadway safety, of congestion and greenhouse gas emissions. And that same context is where we begin from talking about the need for a new transportation solution. Um, we know that in addition to some of those challenges, we also have challenges with affordability throughout our region. And that in the next 30 years, we're expected to have 3 million more people coming to the front range. So what is front range? Oh, this is so hard. <laughs> what is Front Range Passenger Rail? It's a proposed inner city train service. Um, looking at the Front Range, our first chunk that we're really studying and implementing right now is from Pueblo through Denver down to Fort Collins or up to Fort Collins. Um, so we have a longer term vision though in our statute and our, our board vision of connecting to New Mexico and Wyoming in the future. Um, a unique part of our process is that we're looking to use um, tracks that the freight railroads own so we can minimize that initial investment and ideally get service started sooner than later. Um, so again, just kind of some key terms in terms of this work is commuter rail versus inner city rail. I think a lot of us are familiar with the RTD system, which is that, you know, serving a primarily one metropolitan region with many stops along the way. Um, in contrast, we're looking at inner city rail, which tends to connect major markets across the state. The so stations are further apart and the train's able to go faster. So I think part of our work in education is just understanding and communicating this different kind of train service. Um, and as part of that different service type, it means we can serve different kinds of trips. I think so often we think of trains purely in this model of commuting to and from work. And we recognize in this post pandemic world, that's not really how we transport ourselves most of the time. So we're looking for people that are trying to get to sporting events, tourists, people you know, with an aging population and how can we serve those with reduced mobility. Kind of all gamuts of trips can be served through an inner city model. This microphone. Okay. Um, I think I don't want to get too far into the history because um, Jacob said it really concisely and because I want us to be forward focused. But I do just want to note that, you know, our current work builds upon 15 ish years of visionary planning. It's always so funny to define the start date. Um, recently, I heard that a 1982 Amtrak report mentioned a front range passenger rail system. So I never know how long we've been working on this, but there have been some really powerful recent actions regarding, as Jacob said, the creation of the, of the Front Range Passenger Rail District. So we're honoring our history, but also looking forward. So what is this district? Um, we are a new special district. We are the largest special district in Colorado, and we were created to um, finance, design, construct, maintain, operate a passenger rail service along the Front Range. Um, the map on the right, the blue is our is our district boundary. Um, and you'll note that it is a very quirkily gerrymandered boundary. And the idea for that is that um, in part, it would be a well-positioned boundary to um, pass a ballot initiative that would enable the financing of the system and further governance. So that's why it's that kind of um, interesting variety of, of widths regarding rec around I-25. Um, and additionally, the district um, has a role working with local communities to develop station area plans. And um, we have the power to work with local communities to create station improvement districts. Maybe that's the right distance. Okay, um, as Jacob mentioned, we have a, a large board of directors, uh, many of whom are in our room today. So it's so good to see you, Joan, Deborah, Claire, and others I'm probably not even noticing. Um, we have a 24 person board of directors, seven are ex officio, but our board is really meant to kind of bring together the many partners and interests that have a crucial role in bringing passenger rail to the front range. So we have 15 to 
40 years of, of planning and vision, we have this new government district created with the governance and the financing piece to be able to bring this to fruition. We are fortunate to have incredibly strong state support with the governor's office and really a champion in that, in that leadership role. And quite frankly, I probably like all your presentations, we have IIJA and the new passenger rail programs and money created through the bipartisan infrastructure law. So more specific to where we're at today, um, so the quarter identification development program is one such new IIJA program. And I kind of think of it sort of like an advanced training program or a college for new passenger rail programs. This is a new program created through IIJA and it really is intended to help um, kind of people across the country like our region develop new passenger rail programs. So it provides kind of technical expertise, that capacity building, um, as well as a really generous local to federal funding match. So um, federal funding from a 10, 90, 20, 80 local to federal split. We um, applied to be part of this program in March and are hopeful to be accepted in this fall, likely in October. This microphone. Okay. Um, as Jacob mentioned, we're doing our service development plan right now. And essentially what that is, is a feasibility plan to the Federal Railroad Administration that really lays out the business case for the service and really documents um, how to most effectively implement that kind of initial service. So um, it builds upon the alternative evaluation that was completed in 2020 and takes a lot of that kind of preliminary planning work and just kind of advances it. It does more robust operational modeling and kind of gives us that, that starting plan for that initial service. Um, so where are we in this whole process? I think is a question I often think about. Um, we are, we're kind of halfway there if you, if you look at it at the blue bar. Um, we're doing service planning. We're looking at financing strategies. What kind of financing funding would be needed to construct and maintain the system? What is the appetite for um, different kinds of financing and funding? And how do we structure that going into a ballot initiative? Um, after our service development plan is done in mid to late of next year, we'll go into NEPA. We're hopeful that a lot of the preliminary planning work that's been done thus far can be carried into NEPA, um, kind of a PEL or PEL-like model. And then from there, um, we go into construction. I think a big thing in communicating this also is that the opening day service will, if, if all things go well, will not be the service 20 years from now, right? We kind of start somewhere and as ridership grows and as people transportation mode uh, shift, we expand our routes and our frequencies. The other thing I wanna add is that while we're focusing on this Pueblo to Fort Collins as our kind of first vision, um, phasing is possible, right? Sometimes you build it section by section and that's still being determined. Okay, this is a massive endeavor and there's a lot of sections and parts to the endeavor from kind of raising the financing needed to generating support for a ballot initiative to actual station planning and station development, um, multimodal connectivity, and then just actually implementation. And so it will take all of us from grass, grass tops groups, business organizations, MPOs, planning groups, uh, all levels of government working together. So just wanted to get a kind of a picture, sense of, sense of how big the picture is. Um, and this is probably my last slide. The district at this point in time has kind of a preliminary sketch of likely going to the ballot in 2026 for a big taxing initiative to get the funding to really construct and maintain the system. So I just wanted to give an initial sense of some of those key touch points on our way to 2026. Um, things you'll note is, you know, I think we'll have to choose an operator for the system, finish our service plan, finish NEPA, make sure we do our homework regarding the cost that so we know what we're going to the voters for. Um, you know, coordination with RTD and making sure that we have kind of um, some of that partnership worked out. Uh, and then obviously agree with the freight railroads to make sure that we're all working in step together and, and are asking voters for a project that really is um, the defined project. So that is my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or happy to give time for the rest of the agenda. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? So we all know that the uh, Northern Front Range have been, has long been promised commuter rail and we have yet to see that come to fruition anytime soon, even though our residents pay the taxes towards the fast tracks. How are you partnering with RTD uh, and coordinating with them to ensure that our local communities receive, are able to access through stops possibly along <laughs> your route? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So I think the underlying theme is that we are in a shared space, and so how do we best coordinate our separate projects, but also explore where there is integration, where there's partnership. I think it's also a question you're getting at is, is perhaps, you know, they, they ask for our money and, and we don't feel like they fully delivered. How do you, how are you going to fully deliver for us? Right. And so I think that's partially what I'm saying in terms of taking our time to really go through the environmental process and be slow in our cost estimating. Um, so I guess in a more, in a more concrete way, we meet regularly with RTD and with the Northwest Rail Peak Service study folks and are actively coordinating with them. We've also brought in a consultant to help us start to kind of create better overlap between that study and the service development plan to kind of identify some of those key projects that are shared across the pro the key infrastructure investments shared across the two projects that we could leverage and kind of have partnership opportunities. But, um, you know, clearly he's looking right at me and she is on our board and her, her board role is the, the connecting the dots and, and magically fixing fast tracks. So I'll let her chime in if she wants to chime in. But, uh, you know, yes, that is, that is the sensitive challenge that we face and are working on. Yeah, I'll just, I, it is a challenge and it's, it's going to be, uh, and, and the mayor picked out opinions. So it's going to be a political challenge for some of us to get voter approval, uh, given, you know, the, the sense that they're already paying for something like this. But, um, I think we're trying to, uh, be very careful about the service development plan process and, in the statute, uh, and this was something that um, Boulder County and City of Boulder lobbied for very strongly, saying that we can't go to the voters until we have identified the corridor and we have a financing so that we can we can show the voters exactly how we're going to do this, or how we're going to build the whole thing out. So I think you know we're very mindful of that concern and going to try to do everything we can to avoid it. A, a follow-up, or you could? Uh, uh, Director Baca. Great. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I've sat in a couple of Front Range Passenger Rail presentations, and, you know, I, I see this fourth bullet point. I don't know which slide this is. It's what's the Front Range Passenger Rail. Um, the use of existing tracks shared with freight railroads. So what are the viable freight railroads coming out of Denver? Because that piece of criteria leans it heavily to one rail out of the three options that are. I feel like I understand your question, but I also don't inherently know that I do. So I'm gonna start answering it and feel free to change my course. So, um, North of Denver, there are two and a half essentially routes north of Denver that are freight tracks. And so essentially there's the Union Pacific um, Greeley subdivision that goes north of Denver up through Brighton and through Greeley that connects to Fort Collins. And there's the BNSF Front Range subdivision that goes through Denver, Longmont, Boulder, Fort Collins. Um, I know those cities are in the inverse order there. But um, I think your question is, so the infrastructure exists, and I'm not certain if your question is how viable or how challenging will it be to access and utilize and partner with the freights? Is that what your question is, or not so much? Uh, my question is, is that it feels like, based on that criteria point, that one track and one route is more viable than the other two. That the, there's a total of three, I understand, are being... Yeah. Um, and then also your update on the work being done with the Northwest Passenger Rail really feels like this project is going to Boulder and that the rest of the front range um, up and down the corridor, uh, that we're checking boxes and we're here to vote. And so then my follow-up question to that is, based on the district, um, how many voters are either by county or by city? I'm sure people. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I kind of glossed over the slide, but to kind of go back a little bit, um, in 2020 was a really robust visioning process that, as Jacob said, when he was on the predecessor rail commission um, board, that really looked at essentially six alternatives for a rail system that brought it down to three and kind of from there made a recommendation for the best one. 
And what the what the alternative analysis really recommended was starting on a freight rail system because it's probably the best first step. Starting with what they call a starter service, so um, a feasible first, you know, the, the elephant thing earlier, right? You can't swallow the elephant in one bite. You start a system that is achievable, and you build from there. Um, and what they found in, in the study through their through their outreach and through their quantitative modeling and their conversations was that the the route that seemed the most feasible and kind of the best bang for the buck was going through um, the Northwest Rail Corridor. The legislation that created the district. Um, has a line that essentially says, you know, the the preference or the the consideration should be given for looking at the Northwest Rail Corridor, um, and then additionally, the the federal grant that was received in 2020 to do a service development plan um, has named the major markets, and it has named the major markets of of Longmont and of Boulder and, and routes along that. So while the route is in no way defined, and while it's completely subject to NEPA. You're right that there is a direction that we're heading as we try to solidify down to that first implementable project. Um, I recognize that it's challenging and there's such a large investment that is, you know, obviously it's it's one line. We want to have all the lines. Our hope is that by taking what kind of the data and the kind of the experts have shown to us to be the best first step, that we can then expand the system over time. But but I hear you, right? I hear you. It's like this is a massive investment and it is really challenging when. There's such a, I'm looking at a different map right now. This is funny on my screen. Um, there's such a broad swath of the front range and, you know, and the line we get is, is this, you know, the tiny little straight line. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is. Uh-oh. Director Vidim. So um, to add uh, a balance to what I'm, what I'm really going to say, is I love so I, I have I have traveled on three occasions on the Super Chief, usually acknowledged as the greatest passenger train ever existed. Next, to every every single time the Union passes through our area, I'm there to see it and to photograph it. A friend of mine has actually been an engineer on that train. Hopefully, I'm working an angle. To, I could get a ride on it. Okay, so now that now that I've buttered you all up with those comments, there's certain realities. The general impression is that people of modest income tend to ride on trains. Okay, this is not true because traveling on a train is very expensive. So the people that ride on trains generally are people of higher income. Next, every single passenger train operation in the United States where the passenger can travel more than 100 miles currently is generating negative cash flow, big losses. For example, Am Amtrak loses gazillions of dollars every single year. Okay, so we operate in a, an environment where there is not infinite capital. So if we have a, a rail system as described, think in terms of what program you are now going to cut off or defund because this rail system will create a significant negative cash flow and that money has to come from some. Thank you for uh, considering my thoughts. Respond or move on to the next question. I'm happy to respond, but I feel like the question was directed towards his fellow board members. Director Mauer. Director Thank Mauer, you. then Director Peck. Um, thanks for coming and doing a presentation for us tonight. So I know 2026 is just around the I'll ask you some hard a hard question here. Mm -hmm. Kind of thinking you've got your route established and it says local communities for the developed train stations. Tell me, um, has that been pretty successful? <laughs> Working with local communities to develop train stations? Yeah. Well, it's it's a it's a fascinating enterprise of some are hundreds of years old and already exist and some are just, you know, maps on you know, dots on a map that we're envisioning and haven't facilitated yet. So it depends upon the community entirely. I think that, quite frankly, if I were a community, 
there's that tension of, I think, really wanting to preserve land and make sure that if this is train's going to come, I can develop there and maximize the benefit. But also, you know, it's, it's a little uncertain. And so I think there's that tension. And I recognize that a lot of communities are not as interested in having the train service. Um, so it depends on the community entirely. But I think that it's really a pretty fresh conversation. And so I don't want to yet say um, how it's going because I think it's too new to, to know how it's going. But but I'm here to Thank I'm here you. I'm here for part two though. I'm so happy to hear the second part of your question. That was it. I just that gave me a great measurement what to expect in the future. Yeah, and I I think that um, <laughs> so we just had our first birthday. So I, I sometimes I take a moment and I think we're only one year old. It's okay. There's a lot we know. We're we're just getting our feet under ourselves. Um, but I do think a big goal of ours in the next year is to really better be able to flesh out kind of the station planning process and the support we can provide locals to help them really figure out how to plan that and make it a locally led effort that integrates well into the future rail system. So hopefully when I see you guys next year, I'll be better at using the mic and I'll have a better um, resources on that question. You're doing awesome with the mic. Okay. Oh my gosh. Awesome. Director Peck and then Director Moldy. Thank you. So I want to address uh, Director Vidim. I totally agree with you, and the uh, they, that we the way we are going to finance this has been on my mind from the onset, um, especially in my region. Getting any kind of a property tax or sales tax passed because of our uh, experience with RTD isn't going to work. It just isn't. So I have been talking to um, I talked to. Uh, Doug Rex about this as well as uh, Mr. Papsdorf of having a event fee statewide uh, transportation event fee for everyone who uses our roads. I think about Taylor Swift's incredible concert and what if we had had a dollar and a half or two dollars on every single ticket for transportation because we do need an ongoing source. Uh, so I've been talking to uh, legislators and um, have another one set up next, well, in September with another senator um, just to get this conversation started because I, I think that the state, the governor, needs to put some big bucks into this and not just tell us, do it. Um, it also, for me, thinking about what uh, Director Ordoriso, Ordoricio said, when we were talking about 213 and the governor's uh, transit-oriented development, where is he going to get the money for that transit? So um, I think we need to think out of the box, and I'm trying to do that because I want this train. And <laughs> we can't constantly talk about property tax and sales tax and TIFs, and it's, we always go back to the same tools in our toolbox. So... Anybody has any ideas, bring them forward. <laughs> Thank you, Director Peck. Director Mulvey. Thank you, Chrissy. You did great. And you're fine with the microphone. It's working. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening because, as you can see, there are varying degrees of, I want this, it must happen. And no way, I don't want to pay for it. The degree of mistrust of funding for transportation is not limited to Boulder. I'm the only South Metro representative. And I hear a lot of positives and negatives, but in certain regions, a lot of negatives. And so I want to keep, and we all want to keep hearing from everybody um, about what you want, about what kind of service it is. Because it, the, right now we're in the outreach process. And what matters is how people will use it, if they will use it, and what they want to use it for. Another big factor to address the station identification issue is that those visionaries in 2020 and earlier didn't always go out into the communities to see everything about what is wanted and what communities really want it. And we're in that process now where we have to hear it. We have to hear what people want and what they're going to want and where they're going to want it. So for take Castle Rock, for example, there are several options, but does the mayor of Castle Rock want it? Does the council of Castle Rock want it? Do the commissioners want it? And Mr. Teal will always tell me what he thinks, and I like that about him very much. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to mention is that the district 
it, I didn't like the word, but it was true, might have been gerrymandered for political purposes for advantageous ballot measure thoughts, but it will narrow once the corridor is identified. Statutorily, it will be a certain number of miles um, around the actual corridor that becomes identified. So it will change slightly. And that big kick out in, you know, Douglas and Southern Jeffco and Park County will probably not be what it is now. Um, and then I had another thought. There's lots of them. The bottom line is, um, the idea is as much as the I want rail is the idea for a lot of people, it's got to be practical and it can't be too expensive and we have to build on and use the experiences that work and don't work elsewhere. So um, to answer Commissioner Baca's question about the freight rail lines, freight rail and passenger rail coexist quite well in other areas. Even at a loss, yes, Amtrak has historically operated at a loss, but it functions very well for a lot of purposes in the Northeast Corridor. And so that experience is much better than the California experiences of build it from the ground up, which is super expensive. So it's Dr. Kondo. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to build on what uh, Director Mulvey just said. I. Uh, as a former Navy officer, I lived in Japan for six years around the Tokyo metropolitan area. And for those of you who have been to Asia or high density population areas, uh, mass transit like rail works. So when I look at your timeline, I'm just wondering, have, have you built in here a process step where maybe you're benchmarking other countries or systems to get a sense of how those rail systems came to be and, and how the financing worked and, and, and how did they generate their ridership? I can tell you there's a very interesting history in Japan. Uh, I'm not going to waste your time with that history, but it, it is probably worth studying. Yeah, I think the really good news is that I'm not the person that's doing the, the design, engineering, and planning. And so there are those folks that are far more versed and have been studying the, you know, what's happening across, I think, you know, International models are really helpful and are really aspirational, and we can learn a lot, I think, from a visioning standpoint. But it also, I think, to um, Director Mulvey's point, is important to recognize kind of our U.S. context and what we can learn from other similar systems like the Cascades, the Downeaster Capital Corridor in California. So um, the consultant team working on the development plan is from all over the U.S. and has experience working internationally. So smart minds are, are working on this and I appreciate your point because it really speaks to the need to communicate publicly that what we're doing is new to Colorado but it's not new and that this has worked elsewhere and so how can we bring those case studies in our communication to show you know this is where it's worked so thank you for your comments. Dr. Teal. <coughs> um, uh, I'm actually um, in a very different situation <coughs> And I, we hear from my fellow commissioner colleagues who are dealing with issues of either a route that doesn't serve their uh, their areas or they're confronted with uh, the need to get back into um, uh, make a pitch to their population in order to reserve, serv receive services that uh, is easily compared to a service that they have paid for and not received. Um, I think that actually uh, Director Peck is on to something in terms of uh, probably needing to break from the district funding uh, options that was in the original presentation and go to some sort of statewide because I have the inverse problem and Council Member Mulvey is, is certainly aware of this, but if you look there at the map, it seems uh, there's Front Range Rail coming to Douglas County. Why should we pay for anything? Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much. It was great to be here with you. To update on the statewide transportation program distribution process, uh, Ron, Ron Papsdorf, Director of Transportation, Transportation Planning and Operations, with really a, a pretty important conversation. Uh, welcome. The floor is yours.
Someone leave glasses up here? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, we were here uh, two months ago to talk about, to give a little bit of a primer on statewide transportation program distribution. So we wanted to do a follow-up conversation, give you a little bit of an update, a little bit of grounding on some additional research and data points that we've explored over the last couple of months uh, to kind of inform our conversations with the Statewide Transportation Advisory Committee and CDOT about the allocation of transportation resources around the state. So just by way of a quick uh, reminder, this is part of the kind of lead up to CDOT embarking on an update of the statewide transportation plan and it outlines an assignment of projected transportation revenues available uh, for investment around the state and in different parts of the state. Uh, it provides a long-term view. This happens about every four years or so as part of these processes. Uh, there are a number of different program areas in which uh, funding is allocated, mostly associated with different colors of money, uh, different state funding sources, and mostly different federal funding sources that are utilized uh, by all of us to invest in the transportation systems around the state. Um, and then uh, we develop revenue forecasts based on program distribution decisions that are state level that inform our investment strategies as a region through our regional transportation plan, our transportation improvement program, and even the federal funding that we use to pay for the planning work that we perform as your MPO through the UPWP. So as a reminder, you all just voted tonight to um, allocate the next four years worth of federal and state transportation dollars based on previous program distribution uh, through the TIP, um, uh, almost $500 million worth of state and federal resources um, are now allocated to projects uh, through this TIP process that we just concluded tonight. Um, that two-year UPWP program with all of those things that we plan on doing to address uh, regional and state and federal priorities and mandates um, over the next two years represents about $18 million worth of uh, planning work um, uh, through that MPO function. And then obviously last fall, you all adopted a new 2050 regional transportation plan uh, to address the state mandate about reducing greenhouse gas emissions in this region through transportation efforts um, that relied on planned significant planned investments over the next 30 years, particularly around a BRT program, a bus rapid transit program around the state, but other really important transportation investments over the course of the 30 years of the plan to meet our regional priorities, our regional objectives as outlined in the regional transportation plan in Metro Vision and to address other federal and state uh, requirements. So that's the context and the importance of this discussion. So we wanna kind of ground that for you. Dr. Cog is not just an MPO. We are the greater Denver area transportation planning region. We're one of 15 designated transportation planning regions around the state. So you should have all um, seen this before and be somewhat familiar with this. Um, as we discussed a couple of months ago, uh, that, doctor, that greater Dr. Cog area represents almost 60% of the state's population, um, over 60% of the state's employment, and about 70% of the state's total income and wages uh, generated within this region. So we're a pretty significant part of the state, as we might expect. Um, on the transportation side, uh, we're about half of the total trips per day that happen in this state. Uh, about half of them happen in this region. Um, vehicle miles traveled, so that's kind of the number of trips times the distance of those trips. Um, on the state highway system, we're about half. It's notable that about 20% of the total statewide vehicle miles traveled occur on two facilities in the Dr. Cog region, uh, I-70 and I-25. Uh, the, so the travel in this region on I-70 and I-25 accounts for about 20%, one-fifth of the total state vehicle miles traveled um, every single day. Of the total system, um, aside from the state highway system, but the total system, we're well over half. We're about 54% of, of those vehicle miles traveled. Um, now, the outlier here is that when you look at the state highway system on just a lane mile basis, a total lane mile, so basically one lane a mile long is a lane mile, um, the Dr. Cog region represents about 19% um, of the lane miles. Um, 
However, when you look a little bit more closely, um, of the major facilities, interstates, freeways, expressway lane miles of the state system, we're almost 40 percent of that system. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more on a couple of slides about sort of the difference between sort of if you look, you know, one lane mile is not exactly the same as another lane mile. So we want to talk a little bit about that. I'm also um, looking beyond just the state highway system at the total federal aid system. That's the entire transportation system across the state that is eligible to have federal transportation money spent on it. So think of most principal arterials and collectors in your cities, in your towns, in your counties, even if it's not a state highway, are part of that federal aid system. And that's how we invest transportation dollars through our tip on those non-state highway facilities. Um, we're about we're about 25% of that system, so a little bit more than uh, the share of the, of the state highway system on just a total lane mile uh, basis. <clears throat> a couple of other tran transportation related measures were 46% of the state's uh, traffic fatalities, not something we're proud of, but it is a pretty significant issue that, that, we're, that we represent. And then we're about 70% of the state's total transit trips. Um, another priority that's been set by the state is um, addressing and, um, and priority, prioritizing investments to address disproportionately impacted communities uh, through Colorado's transportation planning and our programming processes. Uh, we've done some analysis of sort of Dr. Cog as a share of those um, identified disproportionately impacted communities uh, in the state where uh, about 56% of all census blocks that are identified as disproportionate, disproportionately impacted communities as defined by CDOT. Um, the next closest transportation planning region is Pikes Peak at 12%. Uh, we're about half of all low-income Coloradans that reside here in the Dr. Cog region. That's triple the next closest transportation planning region. Uh, we're about just over 60% of all people of color of the state reside in the Dr. Cog area about five times the next closest TPR and almost 60% of all housing cost burdened um, households um, are located within the Dr. Cog region. So again, another, another area where we really represent a significant portion of the, of the state total. Um, we've identified preliminarily some principles that we think are, are appropriate to consider when there are conversations going around, going on about um, distribution of different programs. Um, it feels like the formulas that are developed should be based on the purpose and the uses of the program, not sort of a desired outcome for we think we ought to get this much money of this program. It really ought those the the way we define the criteria and the formulas really ought to be it's really tied to the purpose of the pro of the program that is under discussion. We think there should be some consideration of where revenue is raised. We talked about the amount of population, the amount of employment, the amount of wages. Those are pretty good indicators of sort of how Dr. Cog contributes to the revenue that's distributed through these processes. Think mainly of federal and state gas taxes, other user fees. If we, if we represent that much population, that much employment, that much in wages, that's a, lot, that's a good indicator of the economic activity that happens in this region, which is a pretty good indicator of our share of the contribution we make. None of us in this room expect that we would get a dollar for dollar return for every dollar we contribute into the revenue stream, but we probably, that ought to be a consideration, right? And I think even the state of Colorado advocates at the federal level that the state of Colorado ought to get some minimum return in terms of the federal transportation revenues that are generated in the state at the federal level. The state of Colorado ought to get some reasonable, you know, close to return on those monies that are raised. And I think that's a fair principle that Dr. Cog ought to have uh, in these conversations. Definition of the system need is an important consideration in um, defining. So think about, you know, we should consider where the money is raised and where the money comes from. And we should think about the need and the purposes of those programs in terms of defining, maybe thinking about how we structure distribution formulas. And the data points used in the distribution formulas should be complete and accurate. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about those last two points, the definitions of the need and the accuracy and completeness. So I'm going to, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into lane miles. If you remember, the Dr. Cog TPR represents about 19% of the state's lane miles um, when you look at total lane miles. But that's not the complete picture. Um, and, it's, and it's not 
it's not any fault of CDOT. The federal government tells CDOT how to report lane miles of the state highway system, so they, they do that, um, and they do that under that guidance. <clears throat> but as it's reported at the federal level, um, doesn't quite represent all of the system. It's really only the through lanes. And if you think about the system in this region with major freeways, major expressways that have auxiliary lanes and ramps and freeway to freeway ramps, and frontage roads and all, you know, all, these, all these other components, those components aren't actually captured in the data. Um, so when, we're ni when, when this data says we're 19% of the lane miles in the state, that's not really, we don't think that's quite accurate because it's not a complete picture. And again, it's nothing nefarious, it's not a dig at CDOT, it's how they report that to the feds, but they do have that data for the rest of that. And we, we think that data ought to be considered if we're going to use lane miles as an indicator of need in distribution formulas, we ought to consider the whole of the lane miles of the system. Um, the total lane miles also doesn't distinguish between different facility types. So think about, you know, a, a lane mile of an urban freeway might be a little bit different than a lane mile of a state highway out in a rural part of the state. That's neither good nor bad, it just is, right? And it ought to be acknowledged or reflected in the formulas. Because um, we think they have different and significant um, kind of levels of complexity and needs. So here's an example. <coughs> so on the left is Federal Boulevard, just south of I-70 in Denver. It's um, four lanes. It's less than a quarter of a mile long. So if you multiply four by 0.2, you get 0.8 lane miles. That's about a lane mile. The principal arterial under the state's classification system it carries about 30, 35,000 vehicles a day. It's got curbs and gutters and sidewalks and driveways and signals and all that stuff. State Highway 318 in uh, Moffat County, west of Maybell, way up in northwest Colorado, is a state highway. It's a little over half a mile long. It's two lanes. So that's also about one lane mile as classified as a major collector. I think we mostly would agree in this room that those are very different types of facilities and those two lane miles might have some different needs for improvement and operations and maintenance, right, and service. Um, by the way, State Highway 3, 318 in this section carries about 350 vehicles a day. So one lane mile, they're both one lane mile. Um, speaking to the completeness and the accuracy of the data, again, the data is accurate the way CDOT reports it through the online transportation information system because it's focused just on those through lanes because that's what the federal government asked them to report on. But if you look at this section of I-25 south of 225, um, it's, it's reflected in Otis as nine lanes. But when you look at the aerial photograph, it's actually about 17, tra it's actually 17 travel lanes. Um, it's got shoulders, it's got barriers, it's got lights, it's got drains, it's got overhead signs and marking. It's a very complex part of the interstate system in this region. Um, so if you only look at the through lanes, it's nine lanes. But if you look at the complete part of the system, it's 17 travel lanes. So again, that sort of what's the relative equivalency of lane miles and then what's the accuracy when you start to look at the complete information on the system. So I talked about sort of the relevance to the UPWP that y'all just adopted tonight, the TIP we just adopted. We're going to be starting a new plan process looking forward next year. Uh, we'll be embarking on another TIP process, believe it or not, in a, in a short period of time. And the distribution discussions that are going on now are going to affect those resources that we have available to plan for and accommodate. So that's kind of where we're at. I'm happy to take any questions. I uh, really appreciate uh, Director Williams and Director Teal as your representatives on the stack trying to carry this message with our, our other uh, partners around the state table. Uh, they, these are challenging conversations. And Ron, thank you very much for them. And thank you for the, the great information that really helps put some, some real uh, uh, real life example from some of those things. Questions, comments, discussion? Dr. Teal. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Pazdor, for the uh, nod. 
Um, obviously, this is something that uh, Nick usually does the heavy lift on, but this was discussed in our last uh, stack meeting right here um, uh, in the Dr. Cog headquarters. Uh, if you could tell that Ron is passionate about this subject, I would just remind you that before our executive director was our executive director, he held Ron's job. And I was a little, uh, well, the executive director was also passionate about this back when he was our transportation director. Uh, Ron is very pa passionate. I, Ron, I really appreciate you being there as my wingman. Uh, Nick was afraid uh, the people driving into town and then criticizing the road work, so he had to hide in the EOC that night. <laughs> Maybe that's not what it is, but that's what it seemed like. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, Ron, thank you for your help in getting through that meeting. Uh, uh, he was very passionate about it, folks. I really thought I was going to have to tranquilize him uh, about halfway through. <laughs> thank goodness I didn't uh, because his, uh, his uh, assistance at staff support was very much appreciated. Thank you. Director Maurer, and then we'll... Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Ron, and all your passion for this. I equally feel this thing. Um, but I, I'm wondering, you know, these are federal dollars, federal requirements. So other states, do they looking at that as, you know, what are they doing? Yeah, um, good question, Director. So um, most of the resources that are allocated through these uh, distribution processes are federal dollars, and, and there are different, there are different buckets of money uh, and di many different federal programs. Um, some programs have more um, guidance, more specificity under federal law about how they're allocated. So for instance, there's the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program. There's a metropolitan portion of that, that as a large, as a large urban area like Dr. Cog, under federal law, there's a portion that has to be suballocated to us. But there's a lot of federal and state uh, funding programs in the transportation side where the state, through the commission, through the transportation commission, has a, a fair bit of discretion about how they allocate those resources around. And you know, just to to speak to the to the conversation at the last stack meeting around the regional priority program, and I uh, included a little bit of information in the staff memo on the on the RPP program. So not a lot of money, and, and actually what's interesting about that program is it's not even a funding program that kind of comes to Dr. Cog. It's not something that we allocate directly through our TIP. It, it's allocated among the five um, CDOT regions, and obviously Region 1 is most of Dr. Cog, but we have part of Region 4 in the Dr. Cog area as well. And so really we're, we're talking about sort of the fair distribution of the, those funds among the five um, CDOT regions, and it's not a lot of money. It's $50 million statewide right now. Um, so that's, that's, that's not as much of the issue. And, and really, to, to Commissioner Teal's point, not really worth me getting too worked up and frustrated about, except for the fact that it, the RPP formula that gets adopted is often the starting point, the basis for other programs that are more significant, that do have a larger impact. And, and still, even the Region 1 share and the Region 4 shares of $50 million is an important funding package that our CDOT partners use to invest to address regional priorities in this region. And so they, they are important. Um, that, that particular formula does become fairly, fairly important in terms of it becoming a basis or a starting point for many, other, many of the other programs, <laughs> even if it's not necessarily adopted as precisely the formula for some of those other programs. It is often the starting point. And as an example, when the state was developing its last 10-year plan, um, because of a difference of a recommendation that came out of stack for the RPP formula, that was more advantageous to the rural parts of the state because it more emphasized that lane mile information. So remember, if you think about us, we're, we're a bigger share of lots of other measures, but we're a smaller share of lane miles. When you just look at through lane miles and you just look at totals, they emphasize that measure. So region one got less money under that formula. The commission saw that the region one in the Denver area really wasn't getting close enough to more of an equity level. And so the commission ended up overruling that decision. But the state in setting investment targets for the 10-year plan 
which affects lots of investments in this region, right, um, through CDOT, kind of compromised and selected a point between the original stack recommendation and the Transportation Commission ultimate decision, right? And so even that sort of compromised what CDOT targeted for a level of investment in this region. Plan. So it does become important to not just us, but to this entire region. And, you know, when the state is asking us to do a lot in terms of addressing the state's greenhouse gas emission issues and, and other transportation issues in the state, and then not supporting us through a fairer, not, not dollar for dollar, but a fairer distribution of resources, it makes it really hard for us to, to help them accomplish those objectives. Dr. Spear. Thank you. Um, I've just got a couple of questions. I'll just do them one at a time. Um, the first is, can you talk a little bit about the um, what's coming next in terms of understanding how uh, this type of analysis will inform the program distribution process? Uh, thank you, Director. So we are trying to share this information with our partners around the state and with and with CDOT and with our transportation commissioners. Ultimately, uh, the statewide transportation advisory committee stack makes recommendations, not decisions. The commission, the transportation commission, ultimately, um, I think CDOT's targeting for just after the first of the year in early 2024 for the commission to make final decisions on all of these programs. Um, so that'll be that'll be the process. So as as stack kind of works through individual programs, we'll continue to sort of share this information as as we're able to and advocate as much as we can, but. We're we're one of fifth, we're one of actually 17 votes at the stack table because two tribes are represented as well. So it's the 15 TPRs plus two tribes. So we're one of 17 votes. Um, we often get outvoted. Um, yeah. Um, so, but ultimately the commission is the final arbiter on on those decisions. So we'll continue to talk to other folks and share our perspectives and and talk about why this is important and and different ways to look at this. Great, thank you. Um, and then my other question was, does this have anything to do, uh, I heard that CDOT was going to be examining and potentially redrawing some statewide transportation district boundaries. Is this connected at all? Um, it, it is not directly connected. Um, so let's see, that was House Bill 1110, right? The, the, 1101, thank you, Darius, yes. <laughs> but that, yeah, so that did direct CDOT to do a study of the transportation planning region boundaries. So that work's going on. We had um, we had a presentation from CDOT last month, or the month before, I think, um, to talk a little bit about that. So that's kind of ongoing. That, that could change the dynamics a little bit if any of the TPR boundaries change. Obviously, then the data kind of for the different geographies could change. Um, so there's that connection, but it's not being, they're not being considered together. Dr. Binkley. Talk much, so I'm not sure how this works. Uh, I just had a question and that was, I'm curious when you brought this up, what, what did they say back to you? Like what was kind of the pushback? Feel free, Director Teal. <laughs> well, first of all, it was a very unique uh, uh, opportunity for me. Um, the, many of you know, I represented the town of Castle Rock here for six and a half years, and it was a very unique opportunity for me to have people point across the room and look at me and say, Denver. <laughs> <laughs> I know how you feel, Kevin. I know how you, I feel your pain. <laughs> that could have come in handy. Um, uh, it, a, a very passionate argument, I, I think, was put forward in order to change the matrix on how that lane miles, the more complex lane miles are considered. And we were talking about enhanced uh, uh, infrastructure and it taking, it being used in account as a weighing method on factoring that federal line miles, uh, lane miles that would be reported to the feds. We were joined uh, really in the voting by our fellow MPOs uh, by and large. And at one point we actually were supporting a, uh, an option that was introduced by Pueblo MPO. Um, but we were just outvoted. Um, and to the point where we devoted a great deal of time to a very detailed conversation 
to only then have a motion be made by one of our one of our colleagues from a rural TPR that just swept the room and swept the vote, uh, swept the discussion and closed. So um, um, a stack is uh, perhaps not the uh, place to be in terms of being one of the several MPOs because the TPRs expressed many times how, um, and Ron alluded to this, and so I, I will certainly paraphrase, but for us, this is more important as a planning tool for future planning. There was expressions from them that this was the money they relied on. Hope that answers your question, ma'am. I was just wondering if there was something I wasn't seeing from the other side. You know what I mean? Like if they had any like valid, I don't mean it like that, but I mean besides just money, like things I hadn't thought about, that's all I didn't. It, it, again, the uh, the, um, the the population um, calculation that was put forward was uh, to to better accommodate those areas of the state that are experiencing growth. Um, whereas I don't think it took away from necessarily from those that were not experiencing growth. Um, and then when we talk about upgrading our uh, methodology for how you calculate those lane miles, it would have been to give more weight to what we see in our urban um, corridor and more specifically in our interstate uh, infrastructure. And um, a, a, a robust conversation occurred that was shut down. Well, come in. Thank you very much. Uh, great information, helpful, frustrating, I know, but, uh, but thank you. With that, we will move ahead to the Regional Bus Rapid Transit BRT Partnership, and he's back, Jacob Brieger, Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening again. When you're the last formal presentation of the evening, it behooves to say that you'll be brief. I will be brief. However, <laughs> I did want to give you um, an update and information around um, this kind of new partnership that's been forming, the Regional Bus Rapid Transit Partnership. Um, so first, just a little bit of background um, on bus rapid transit. Um, originally, you know, efforts around bus rapid transit were based on um, RTD's Northwest Rail, excuse me, Northwest Rail. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> it's been a pleasure working for you and Dr. Cog. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <clears throat> it was originally based on RTD's Northwest Area Mobility Study and subsequent regional bus rapid transit study um, over the last several years. Um, when we prepared our 2050 regional transportation plan, um, we took that work and we tried to evolve it to the next step, um, including 11 specific bus rapid transit corridors in a new bu bus maintenance facility within our 2050 regional transportation plan, both in the version that we adopted in April 2021, but also last year um, during our work on the greenhouse gas um, greenhouse gas rulemaking or, or compliance with the greenhouse gas uh, transportation rule. When we updated our 2050 regional transportation plan, one of the most important things we did last year was to advance the implementation timeframe of several of those corridors um, as part of our overall compliance strategy. Uh, we believed in the network, we believed in the strategy, so we actually accelerated the time frame of some of those corridors to implement them. And, you know, not just work done through Dr. Cog, although as Dr. Cog with the MPO representing all the stakeholders in the region, and we all came together to do that. Um, but CDOT also in their 10-year plan um, includes bus, ra bus rapid transit corridors uh, within our metro area, um, and they did that as well for greenhouse gas compliance. 
I also want to recognize CDOT's region-wide arterial BRT um, and transit improvements um, kind of funding source, $170 million that they have um, towards this effort as well. Um, City of Denver, um, as Denver folks know, you recently updated your Denver Moves Everyone plan where you've articulated um, the bus rapid transit network and the rapid transit network within Denver as well. And there are some other plans that include this too. So this really is sort of a region-wide and metro-wide kind of effort around bus rapid transit planning. So specifically, just to kind of show you what's in our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, as I said, there are 11 distinct bus rapid transit corridors within the plan. The idea is that, you know, theoretically over the 30 years of the plan together as a region, we do, you know, say one of these every few years, we would kind of work through them together um, and implement these 11 corridors by 2050. Given the um, work that we did in the greenhouse gas work last year, um, as I said, we accelerated some of those corridors. So here is the current sort of version of that where you're seeing that five of these, the region is going to implement by, 20, by 2030. Very, very assertive, very ambitious, no question. Another five by 2040, and that last one by 2050. Also showing some planning level cost estimates. These are big picture, conceptual kind of corridor level um, cost estimates. These will get refined as each of these projects goes through um, the planning and project development process. So don't get hung up on the cost numbers. But I show them that just so you can see that even at this level, in the overall 30 year look in the long range plan, you know, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars um, going into the bus rapid transit network. It's really important. So how do we do all this, right? This is a lot to do in the next few years. So several agencies came together to form um, the regional BRT partnership. Um, Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, Denver, Aurora, Boulder County, FTA. Um, there's probably one or two other jurisdictions I'm forgetting. All are part of that partnership. Uh, we've been meeting over the last several months. The idea behind the partnership, it is, it is a multi-agency planning, funding, and implementation partnership. We are coming together to steward and shepherd the implementation and the coordination of this BRT network in this region over time. As you've already seen, one of the foundational principles is that there's more work, especially by 2030, than any single agency could lead or do alone. This does need to be all hands on deck. We all need to come together um, and pool our resources, pool our talent, pool our dollars, um, and pull our collective efforts to make this happen. Um, really in brass tacks of the partnership, it's to collaborate and assist the multiple BRT corridors simultaneously. We can't stovepipe this. We've got to work together. We've got to coordinate. Um, so coordinating and monitoring the corridor level work, issues, schedules, resources. And then at the system-wide level, can we find some efficiencies around things and consistency around things like navigating through the federal project development process, going through NEPA? Um, can we do things in terms of financing, operations, station platforms, maintenance, branding? You know, I could rattle off a whole set of things, but, you know, this is going to be a system when it's implemented. Can we think of it and work together as a system? Our initial focus has been the alternatives analysis, NEPA, and planning and design work on Colorado Boulevard, Colorado 119, Federal Boulevard, um, East Colfax that Denver and Aurora and others have been working on for some time, and then East Colfax Extension, and I'll talk about these corridors more in a second. And then we're also thinking ahead to kind of the next tranche of corridors. Um, we are starting work, Dr. Cog, in coordination with stakeholders, um, leading the Alameda Corridor Study through our um, corridor planning pilot program. Um, and then Broadway Lincoln um, has been funded through our TIP, I-20, you know, for the initial kind of planning study um, that several of you were involved in, I-25 North, Spear, Leedsdale, Parker, um, Colorado 119 Extension, or other ones kind of in that next tranche of corridors to be implemented. So some people like words, some people like pictures. So I wanted to show this kind of in visual form. Really the nucleus here, again, is that regional BRT partnership and the agencies that you see listed that I named. Uh, we are the folks at the staff level coming together, senior staff from all of these agencies. We are meeting monthly. Um, our meetings are getting longer and more complex by the month because we've got a whole set of issues to tackle. Um, and then um, kind of arrayed around that is the different corridors um, that we're showing, particularly the ones by 2030 or that first tranche, kind of both their implementation time frame and who's taking the lead the lead in, tour, in terms of the stewardship of the planning process. Another foundational principle that I want to be clear on is that regardless of which agency is leading a corridor planning or project development effort, all of the stakeholders are equally 
um, or to their, you know, to their level of comfort involved in sort of planning efforts. So when I say, for example, CDOT is taking the lead on the federal BRT corridor, but many other stakeholders are involved in that work. We are taking the lead on stewarding um, and shepherding the initial planning process for East Colfax extension, but we're doing that in very close coordination with Aurora staff um, and with CDOT, for example. Um, so you can see that CDOT's leading some, Dr. Cog is leading a couple. Obviously, Denver want to recognize your efforts with East Colfax. So talked a little bit about the partnership itself that we are um, having our monthly meetings to really get our arms around what does this regional partnership look like from an organizational perspective, both internally, how do we structure ourselves, what do we focus on, but externally, how do we help the region. Uh, we are rotating hosts so that each agency has a chance to host and kind of help shape the agenda. Uh, we're looking at some things internally around a partnership framework, things like a charter, um, a project management plan or program management plan, um, and other things that we need to be successful as a partnership. And then we're also looking, as I said, outwards, externally, uh, defining major process milestones and timelines for each corridor, things that we can do to kind of help each of the individual corridor coalitions implementing uh, these BRT projects. And then coordinating, as I said, and integrating corridor level planning efforts um, and again, here's a partial list of kind of those implementation um, related issues. I won't say these to you again, you can read them, but you know, the complexity that you, you all know is involved um, in planning for and implementing a major sort of transit investment, a major multimodal investment and a corridor investment are the things that we're focusing on. So we're just at the beginning of this effort. There's a lot more to come, um, but wanted to bring you up to date, give you information about this, and we'll be back in a few months to give you updates. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Yes. Dr. Mella. Um, with the overall partnership, are you setting common standards for frequency or service level for all the lines? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. We'd like to get there, but with the caveat that, look, we recognize with 11 corridors, each of them are unique. Your communities are unique. Your contexts are unique. The corridors are unique. We do want to find those commonalities. We are building a system together, right? However, you know, there are, you know, there are local contexts to each corridor. So, yes, we'd like to get to a system, common branding, common platform design, common operations, right? Um, but understanding that there are some unique challenges and opportunities within each corridor as well. Dr. Flynn. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Jacob, uh, I'm curious whether some communities along these corridors were invited to participate and declined? Because I noticed there were some, there some gaps there. Yeah, that's a very good question. The short answer is no, but let me, let me be transparent and explain that context a little bit. So several core agencies came together originally to form the partnership, right? Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, Aurora, and Denver in particular. As we have started to build out the partnership, we have asked ourselves the question, we know that there's a lot of stakeholders. I mean, the, the 11 corridors, if I show the map again, touch a lot of communities within our region, right? How do we involve, how do we find the map? <laughs> there we go. How do we involve, you know, all of these, all of these stakeholders, all these local governments, right? So that's an ongoing question. Uh, we want to make sure we do that the right way. We want the partnership to be focused and we particularly Agencies in this initial version of the partnership are those sort of regional agencies or multi-corridor agencies, right, um, that, that really have that regional sort of perspective. But as we continue to do the implementation work, we are absolutely going to involve all of the stakeholders, all the jurisdictions in which these corridors touch. What we're trying to figure out is what is the best way, you know, do we have a, a local government sort of coordination group or a, a subcommittee, you know, how do we do that? We're still working through that. So bottom line is that those folks will be involved, but at least initially the partnership is those big level agencies to kind of bring that regional focus and get us going. Thank you. So I noticed there's, um, like in the, in the TIP funding, there was a feasibility study for 287 bus rapid transit. There's also um, funding for Highway 7 where we're seeing rapid uh, population growth, but they're not included in, in your 11 corridors. I guess uh, my question is the th thought process along that line. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. So in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, we identified several categories of project and priority investments in the plan. Some of those were very specific BRT corridors, like the 11 that you see listed here. Others are what we call transit planning corridors, and that gets to the corridors you mentioned, Director. We recognize Colorado 7 is a perfect example. Um, 287, as you said, um, there's a couple in Douglas County. There's some throughout the region. 
that are really important, and, and there's um, effort um, and there's priority towards further developing the transit vision or the multimodal vision for those corridors, the long-range plan, and even now the TIP dedicates dollars towards those planning and project development efforts, just not quite ready to call them BRT yet in the same way that we're identifying these 11 corridors specifically as part of the BRT system. So they're there, and they're getting funded and worked on, but in a little bit of a sort of different way than um, as we're working on the BRT network. Does that answer your question? Yes, I guess the follow-up is, could they be, if they reach a point in the future, can they be added to this plan or? Yeah, absolutely. Transportation planning, like all planning, is a snapshot in time. We update the regional transportation plan every four years, and we recognize that projects go through a project development process where they get, you know, more sort of explicit project definition. And so as that continues to unfold in these corridors, their status in the plan could change over time, yes. Maybe. Thanks. Um, this is really great. I'm happy to hear about it. I'm, I'm kind of wondering with CDOT's involvement, I know on the 119 corridor where they're identified as the lead, their participation is around the improvements to the highway that are, that, uh, are uh, going to be happening along with this. Are they, uh, are we also going to see any CDOT operating money um, to help with these corridors? Um, I don't want to speak on behalf of CDOT. Darius, I don't know if you'd like to opine on that or not. That, uh, thank you for the question. That's, um, I, I don't think I have the answers for you tonight, and that may be something that we can uh, take a look at on, on, on as, as this thing is fleshed out uh, a little bit more. Um, I don't want to give an answer that is erroneous uh, on here, but do know that uh, um, Region 1 in particular, the staff over there has been working hard on collaborating on, on doing a lot of the things that Jacob has mentioned on, on their end. And as these things are built out, the more of the information that is needed and the resources needed will, will will come together and and be realized. So so those those dis, those discussions are ongoing. Yeah, Director Levy and everyone. I think the big picture answer to that question is that all of these corridors are in different spots, right? Like Colorado 119, East Colfax. You know, very very well developed. You all have been working on those for years. We understand most of what's going to be in those corridors. Some of these corridors are more conceptual, right? They're just at the beginning of the planning and project development stage. So there are questions like those that we need to answer over time. Who is gonna operate these corridors? How will they be funded? Um, will they all be eligible for federal funds? Do we need to look for other funding sources? I mean, there's a lot out there. So I think the short answer is that to be determined um, on some of those, but everything is on the table in terms of being creative and innovative in terms of how we implement, fund, and operate these, these projects over time. Question to Mel. Oh, just going back to the question of setting standards in the common definition of BRT and then, you know, when 287 or Highway 7 get integrated into this BRT system. Um, so how does US 36, which was, um, it, it was brought out to essentially be BRT when, you know, the flat iron flyer is our um, consolation prize, um, but it's not, not listed as BRT. I'm seeing I-25 North being listed as BRT. I'm, I'm rather dubious either one really can be considered BRT in the true definition of it. So I'm, I'm just not seeing a consistency in how we're defining it. So I would just encourage this group to really be clear about, again, what is the standard, what is the baseline for service and definition of BRT, particularly around accessibility because they're so different between a Colfax system versus a highway. Uh, no, that's a very good point. There's not an easy answer to that question. The way I'll answer it is to say that um, there are organizations out there, ITDP is one that I, that I know of, Institute for Transportation Development and Policy, I think, or something very close to that, um, who have articulated a checklist or a, you know, sort of list of BRT elements, right? What makes it truly BRT? And it's not just one or two or five things. It's really like 10 or even 20 different things. And so this is a national debate, right? Most of the, not most, many of the BRT systems in this country check several of those boxes, but not all of them. 
are they truly BRT? Are they close enough to BRT? Are they BRT light, right? So that's that's a legitimate debate, and, and you touch on that very important point. I think where we're coming from here is that, again, as you pointed out, these corridors are different. East Colfax and Denver is very different than I-25 North or US-36 up to Boulder, right? But for all of these BRT corridors, we want to, to use a cliche, to check as many of those boxes as we can. Maybe we get there on most of them, on, on most of the boxes. Maybe some of them are a little bit different. But we want to, if we're going to call it BRT, we want to get as close to true BRT as we possibly can. Again, recognizing um, there are distinct um, contexts in each corridor. Does that answer your question? Sort of. <laughs> I'll give you one more specific example. I don't want to get over my skis on this. We're at the very beginning of this planning process, but just a specific example to make your point. Level boarding is a BRT sort of thing on the checklist, right? To have level boarding on these buses. Can we do that everywhere on all 11 of these corridors? I don't know. Are we going to try for that? Are we going to come in with the assumption that that's a standard we want to aim for? Yes. Okay. It was just, yeah. <laughs> Those, those kinds of standards and expectations, region-wide, it would be helpful to establish. And I would like to see, you know, 287 and 7 and US 36 integrated into that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Our last comment will be from Director Wheel. Um, great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, help with my understanding. We've got about a billion, a little over a billion dollars in of decades, what are the bigger expense items that, that make them? In terms of? Well, if you, if you look at that billion dollars, is it equipment or is it reconfiguring roads? I'm, I'm just trying to understand a little better. What, oh, in terms of like, you know, where is this money going? Like what, yeah, yeah what's this for? So again, these are, these are, you know, long range 30 year planning level cost estimates. In our plan, we show these cost estimates in terms of what would it take to implement the corridor. So we're really looking at planning, project development, construction, right away, engineering, things like that to get these corridors built, delivered and into service. Obviously over time, there's ongoing operation maintenance, bus replacement, state of good repair, uh, the bus maintenance facility, and there's a whole lot, right, that goes into it. These costs here, again, planning level costs that are really about big picture, what does it take to actually implement these and get these constructed to service? And, you know, honestly, the, the construction, you know, going through the planning process is itself millions of dollars. That's just the way it is. And construction is going to be tens or hundreds of millions of dollars um, to actually do the physical sort of construction on the roadways and the vehicle procurement and those sorts of things. There's a lot that goes into it. Is that getting at your question? Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Appreciate the presentation. Before we move into a speed round of committee reports, uh, <laughs> like the subtlety there, uh, did want to follow up briefly on the information that uh, Commissioner Kraft Tharp shared with us in regards to Lisa Smith's new child. Uh, you know, I, I checked with Doug to see if we had Dr. Cog onesies or something. <laughs> uh, I actually stole that. I, I stole the joke. I stole the joke. <laughs> admittedly, uh, we don't. So we are going to be sending flowers on behalf of the board. So just so you know, we are going to uh, send that to the family. So there you go. With that, committee reports, report from Stack. Huh, I wonder. <laughs> Mr. Williams. Well, I'll be brief. You asked for a speed round here. You heard about the main event, uh, and I, I mean that in its truest sense there. Um, certainly owe Dr. Our Director Tia Labeer. Uh, after this one. Um, so moving on to next month, we'll move into, uh, for the same program distribution discussion, move into um, metro planning, carbon reduction, and the surface transportation block grant. And if it feels like it's going to be contentious, it's back in the basement for me. Uh, I'm there. sure. I, I, I expect nothing less. All right, and uh, other item of note, uh, just update on HB 1101. Uh, first round of public meetings have uh, have concluded. Again, this is the uh, TPR boundary discussion uh, survey going through the end of this month, uh, and then a second round beginning in the fall. Conclude my update. Thank you very much. Moving on to the report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Starker, Mayor Starker. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, we uh, had a general a full caucus meeting on August the second. Uh, we welcomed our new executive director, Heidi Williams. We had a, a stimulating conversation about restarting Colorado condo construction and what the barriers might be to, to uh, make more condo, condominium construction available, uh, 
attorneys with the Brownstein, Hyatt, Farb, and Shrink joined us for that, as well as Michael Gifford with the Associated General Contractors. We had a, uh, a Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, JGM Mint, came and talked about their, their uh, housing and planning priorities. The uh, caucus talked about potential 2024 legislation uh, options and where we might find areas of agreement in that. Uh, we re uh, had a brief presentation on the regional air quality control, and we had a thank you and goodbye to uh, Catherine Marinelli and Peter Kenny, our longtime uh, executive director and an originator of the caucus. And that will conclude my report. Thank you very much. Moving on, report from Metro Area County Commissioners. Mr. Teal, who I think is Nicholas Williams' hero, right? How the heck did I get on this list? Um, I don't know. I, I might have to have a little bit of help from my fellow county commissioners in terms of what may have been reported back to our colleagues. Rex? I I can chime in because I, I I know it was lightly attended because there was a CCI meeting or something going on at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so so basically they had a continued conversation re regarding homelessness initiatives. Um, what else? Said it, Melinda. Wow. That's yeah. Yeah. So it was mostly on the homelessness initiative, um, and I'm, that's going to be continued at the next meeting as well. That concludes my report, Chair. Lovely. <laughs> 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 Three Committee on Aging, they have not met since our last meeting. Uh, report from the Regional Air Quality Council, Mr. Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. I'll mention a couple items. Um, so you may recall that the severe ozone SIP that was, um, that was developed last year, there were some errors in the data that required um, to reopen the SIP to look at chapters 3, 4, 5, and 11. Um, that work has now been done and been resubmitted to the state for whatever happens next with regards to their, um, uh, you know, sending it on to to EPA. So that's that's very good news. The other, the other conversation that was had during that is associated with emission control strategies. Um, they're now last month. You, you may recall we reported that they the RAC made a recommendation to the the health department related to. Um, uh, garden equipment, and, but they're now uh, focused in on oil and gas concepts that they're going to continue to, uh, to kind of flush out over, over the next several months, so stay tuned on that. Report from E-470 Authority, Deborah Moldy, Director Moldy. Thanks. I'll be quick. The, this is a self-funded toll road, so a lot of the um, discussion is always about usage and revenue, and there is a higher degree of usage on this road than ever before. The um, most interesting thing was the interns and slash externs from college. They were deployed in the areas of most need and most use. Uh, civil engineering on the lane widening project and marketing on the, on the safety education concepts. Thank you. Thank you. Report from CDOT. Mr. Beckbaugh. Good evening, Board of Directors. I got that right this month. Um, so, uh, 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 just wanted to add on to the, the comments on the last piece that um, uh, CDOT in its 10-year plan has contributed, uh, or has identified $75 million in years 22 through 26 and $95 million in years 27 plus for the, the BRT to help build the BRT corridor um, uh, project that was presented. Uh, other than uh, some of the some of the, the grants that were awarded that I mentioned last month on, on 6th and Wadsworth and 119, the Transportation Commission did meet today. There will be no meeting tomorrow where they uh, considered um, some budget amendments, um, um, considered North Front Range's GHG report that they submitted this month, and also established the new fuels impact enterprise that was established by the legislature this year. And with that, Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Report from RTD, Brian Welch. Mr. Welch. Thank you, Chair. Three, th three quick things. We are in, we're halfway through the second month of zero fare for better air. We, our board of directors adopted a new fare structure that's affordable, equitable, and simple. And finally, we have secured uh, approval from the Federal Transit Administration to do zero fare for youth throughout the district <laughs> for everyone 19 and under from September 23 through August 2024. Thank you. Very much. A couple of housekeeping items before I have a closing comment before we leave. Uh, housekeeping items will need to exit through that door because we can't get in through the, the 
revolving door out there. So if you haven't been here before, somebody will leave breadcrumbs or something to help you get out. Uh, If you are parked downstairs, obviously, if you haven't already, be sure to see our favorite person about this time of night uh, who has the parking passes, Ms. Melinda Stevens. Um, Our next meeting, uh, board meeting is September 20th. I have a gift for you, and that gift is Labor Day week, work session canceled. No work session. Is that awesome? Okay. Um, one, one closing comment. I think we would be remiss not to acknowledge our, our – uh, we have been through in this state so much destruction. We've been through the fires. We've suffered so much. What Maui and Lahaina is going through right now is, is, is just amazing uh, and, and tragic. The, the death toll, as they've got it now, is 110. That will continue to rise. Uh, you think of a place where you can't necessarily just move a little ways away and, and, and recover and have that be better. Uh, so I encourage us all to keep them in our hearts. Uh, if, if you feel it, if there's a way to donate to any of the charities that are helping that area, we've been through those things, but this is that amplified. So I just I thought it was appropriate to take a moment and, and comment on that. With that cheery uh, thought, uh, anyway, uh, thank you all for all you do. Thanks, staff. This is one of those nights. Dr. Cog has an amazing staff, and, and we, we see that all the time, but tonight's one of those. With that, we are adjourned.